Cuckoo's house. The Houston Cougars have a great short game, and no, we're not talking about the golfers. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougs, the daily podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Andrews, here to break down all things Cougs. If you're a U of H fan or just a hater can step by, please be sure to subscribe down below that we can lay us on the Cougs in your news feed each and every day. We appreciate you making Locked On Cougs your first listen of the day. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. That's where you found us. It is so good to see you again. Uh, obviously, we're doing a giveaway every 250 subscribers like we always do, and we're about at 1,600, so once we get over that 1,600, we're going to 1,750 is the next giveaway. Hit like and subscribe to make sure that we get there. Comment on the videos so that we know you're in the contest. If, if you're talking about some Houston Cougar football short games and talking about a little bit of basketball schedule as much as we can at this point about it, please, if you have nothing else to say, I guess, please be sure to tell us down below what goes on your bagel. Now, as a scoot out for a second, look at the whole rundown. We're going to talk some about the short game that the Houston Cougars are doing on offense, about what they're doing. The second segment, talking about how can that grow this team and program as a whole, what this does for the program. But I do want to spend a final segment talking about the basketball schedule because the basketball schedule comes out at some point on Tuesday. So I guess by the time you're listening to this, this might seem old, but I love talking basketball and cannot wait to get to talk about the basketball season. But first, let's talk some about the short game. Now, I want to clarify a couple things here. One, when I talk about short game, I'm talking about passes initially thrown behind the line of scrimmage or under 10 yards downfield. That means time in the air, not necessarily where the guy ends up after the fact, but the ball travels in the air, goes behind line of scrimmage or less than 10 yards downfield. Um, And I think this is something Houston does very well and think something Houston needs to do or to continue to do, frankly. Um, And so in looking at that, I think it's worth pointing out that like on screen passes alone, Donovan Smith is is 91%, 31 of 33 on the season and has gained 221 yards out of his just over a thousand this season, right? They're averaging 6.7 yards per attempt on screens, uh, which is actually more than they're averaging on any other non-screen pass, which is 6.6 yards per attempt on all other passes. Um, of the 11 total drops this season, only two of them have been screen passes. Those two being the only two incompletes uh, a screen pass in itself. And in its design has not allowed any sacks, no QB hits and just two pressures at all, right? Um, on the whole, I think some people are like, well, obviously, but like he's throwing it to so short. But you also need to play to your guy's strengths and what he does well. Diamond Smith has proven to be very, very accurate in these instances, in these quick windows where he make quick decisions. He's making those throws as seen time and time again. It's usually made on a pre-snap read based on where people align and who's going to do what. I also think there are pre-snap RPOs happening where if he sees this box or this alignment, then he does that thing or vice versa, right? But the screen game and those systems has worked. Again, over a almost a fourth, over a fifth of his passing yards are coming from just 31 of his completions. That's impressive to say the least. Um, on the short yardage stuff, Right under 10 yards, so less than so positive yards of downfield pass, air quotes, but less than 10 yards down the field. He's completing 71.9% of his passes. That's 46 out of 64. Um, generally speaking, between the tackles or the center portion of the field, not always between the hashes because you're not always in the middle of the field, right? Center field can also mean center of the field as in between tackles when you're on the right hash, whatever. He's thrown 30 of 39 and 255 yards. That's a 93.4 QBR throwing over the middle of the field in that short distance. That's being hyper accurate with a bunch of linebacker and other junk in the way there, but it's really being able to squeeze the ball short into a window. And it's probably because he put so much mustard on it when he lets it fly. Right. Uh, in Donovan Smith's college career, he's averaging in his college career, the 2.72 seconds he had to throw the ball at Houston is the least he's had to do in any season uh, at Tech. He'd had uh, almost three in both instances in both seasons. And here at Houston, he's got 2.72. Um, throwing the ball short behind the line of scrimmage, throwing the ball short in that 0 to 10 range uh, helps negate all of that. The behind the line of scrimmage throws, he's getting off in 1.77 seconds, right? And the under 10 yard throws, he's getting off in 2.2 seconds. 
both of that means both of those numbers mean, I should say that he's getting it off well before average time to get the ball off and that he's not running around for his life to do this, right? This is not the kind of throw that he has to escape or evade pressure, helps negate some of the stuff like we saw against TCU when that crazy defense front they have, they rotated nine guys through three spots and kind of wore out the Houston Cougars offensive line. That, that doesn't happen when you're getting the ball off super, super quickly. If anything, it wears defensive linemen out because they have to pass rush when they realize it's a short pass, then they have to chase the ball downfield. They have to go sideline to sideline, et cetera. Um, it kind of wears them on it a different way, whereas if they can just pursue the pass, or that's frankly a much easier job than the one they signed up for, right? Um, short pon- short passing concepts, I have my notes here. I'm just trying to read it, I promise, um, are more likely to break open in these quick throws, kind of quick hitter type moments. Um, and I feel like that's, well, not directly correlated because the 1.7 second seconds is uh, – more broadly or the 2.2 seconds more broad i think it's when all the short concepts are happening very very quick and because they're so quick the decisions happen really, really fast he's making those decisions really fast at a high efficiency rate um i also think that the more houston does this and i, I said to say that in this first segment i, I want to like solidly lay down Dom smith is good at this right um and i think as a coaching staff when you continue to push the things that the coaching staff teaches and does that are also the things that Donovan Smith does well, right? Um, there's no such thing as a perfect quarterback. Nick Patrick Mahomes may feel close at some points, but there's no such thing as a perfect quarterback. And as we saw against Sam Houston State, you can really get in a rhythm once you have several completions in a row. You get several completions in a row by throwing passes that you complete well. You complete these passes well. It's not the sexy big hitter air raid of old where – I, I told you guys, I guess June Jones is really a run and shoot guy, right? And they're not the exact same thing, but they're both downfield passing games, right? Uh, if anything, the area is actually less downfield than the run and shoot does. But I heard June Jones and some coaching stuff I was doing one time, and I worked with a guy that was pretty close to June. Um, but June Jones said that at Hawaii with Colt Brennan, he would throw, or some piece, Colt Brennan, um, he would throw a deep ball once every four or five snaps. And when asked why, he was like, because we can't score on sustained drives. We've got to throw it deep. That's the one thing we're good at. And the takeaway there is obviously like that's what they did because that's what they were good at. The thing that Houston's good at is getting the ball into a playmaker's hands outside in space and going, right? That's all it takes. And that's what these different pass games do. Um, Now, as far as like, fixing things and going with things. I should point out that Donovan Smith's overall passing percentage uh, adjusted for as adjusted completion percentage should say uh, completions and drops divided by the aim to target throws. Not the times he's released the ball out of bounds or whatever is 72.4%. Uh, that's in the top third of all of college football. The goal should be to be doing things that get us to there and things that get that number higher. I mean, he's not having to throw the ball out of bounds. He's not throwing the ball in spots where guys are more likely to drop the ball um, or those kinds of things. Um, and frankly, things that are more easily completed. That's where these short games are. And that's where these things come to play. Now, in the second segment, I'm going to talk some about specifics and X's nose and ways that Houston can take advantage of doing this. I almost got in that second ago. I just got excited and talking about it. If you can't tell, I like talking about playbooks and stuff. But first... I noticed that a lot of people are excited to play Texas Tech and see that Texas Tech is a potential rival game this weekend. And if you look online, like you can see that flights to Texas, flights to Lubbock are less than $200 out of Houston, right? Uh, it's an eight and a half hour drive. Maybe you think that's not a big deal. Maybe you got somewhere to stay along the way, or maybe you stay there, you know, Friday night, if you drive all day Friday or whatever. Da, da, da. But regardless, people are seeing this as a potential rivalry game. And deciding they need to get there and get tickets. And I understand that the tickets box office may say it's a sold out game because it is. But we're looking for tickets in the secondhand market and be really expensive unless you go to game time. Gametime.co is the place to find all last minute tickets to any and all things. Now, uh, you want to go for sure, make sure you like find the right deals and all those kinds of things. Game time is the place for you. Game time is deals and tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts is the best place to find last minute seats. 
You can find exclusive flash deals and sponsor deals for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy theater, and more. With zone deals, you can pick the section of the game time, pick the seats for an average of 18% savings, and game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price guaranteed. And if you don't, if you find something in the same section and row, they'll refund you 110% of the credit. I'm sorry, 110% of the difference. Now, I'm looking at gametime.co, and I have to say this is really, really easy to do when you're looking for things like concerts or movies or um, shows, I should say, not movies. When I say shows, I think of movies. But um, we can look up basketball games, football games, anything you're looking for in any arena. And it can take all the guesswork out of buying tickets in those arenas. You can download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for 20%, $20 off your first purchase. Terms and apply again. Create an account. Redeem code Locked on college, L O C K E D C O L L E G E for twenty dollars off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right, I said in the second segment, I talk some about what specifically we're looking for when we look at these quick hitters, these short game throws, and how they can help grow this team's playbook and help expand what Houston does on offense. Right. Um, first, I think the first thing you got to look at is like all of these, what I call, or staffs I've worked on call now screens, right? I mean, you just take the snap and turn and throw, right? It's an immediate read. Uh, we write, we line up in trips out wide, uh, with man, Jack, let's call it a bunch and man, Jack's the point of attack on the bunch and golden's to his left and Sam Brown's to his right or whatever. And they line up with four over three out there and somewhat of a diamond type formation, da, 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 right? Based on how that diamond's aligned, the receivers check it. They know what they've got. Donovan checks it. He knows what he's got. And let's say it's Manjack taking the point of attack defender and Golden going up to block the first inside guy. And that means that the you know Sam Brown is coming underneath it, coming towards the line, of, towards the line of scrimmage, towards the center on the snap, catching and running upfield behind the two up the middle, kind of down the seam area, right? Those kinds of now screens, the instant reactions based on how they line up, are the kinds of things that Houston's receivers as fantastic athletes, good blockers when they want to. Uh, and they showed against Sam Houston State that when they want to, they're really, really darn good. They showed, frankly, in the first half against TCU that when they want to, they're really, really darn good at those things. Um, getting after it, blocking downfield and that kind of stuff, it also gets the ball in your playmaker's hands. So you get the ball into Matthew Golden. It can get into uh, get into Sam Brown's hands. You can do Joseph Manjack's hands right away. It makes it really, really easy to let the guy go create in space because the name of the game is creating in space. A lot of air raid teams, a lot of guys in Dana's ilk want to do stuff where they make that space before they catch the ball. This is just doing it after, right? You make that, you catch the ball at the line of scrimmage, and you're already making space because it's blocking happening in front of you. Um, those kinds of now concepts, I think, are really, really important for that rhythm we talk about, right? One of the things that Houston did really well in the first drive, even against Sam Houston, they didn't do against TCU and they didn't do against the first half against Rice, but didn't the second half against Rice is they got in a rhythm. They started doing something that worked and started doing some variation of it over and over and over because it couldn't get stopped. Right. Kind of things that like make guys go to the locker room at halftime and redraw stuff up. Houston was able to keep those kinds of things rolling. Another concept that I actually detailed, I think, over the offseason that I love that Dana does when he's done it and when he's calling the plays. And I know he's got a more increased role in the offense. He's not calling the offense. He's not like he's not leading the play calling like he used to. It appears that that was Birch. Looks like there may be some shifting into Iman Yagavi having more of a say in it, all of which Dana's having some final say and sprinkle on it. I think he's having more of a sprinkle on it now than he did before. Long digression, but I think the thing he does really well in calling plays is when we went to call mesh. Mesh concept meaning two receivers cross about five yards off the ball at the middle of the field. They just go from one side of the field to the other. You usually have some sort of a guy hook up behind them. It's just more of a st- sit down kind of a, I call it a stick. Some people call it a curl, but a right, tight end or a man jack type guy will hook up right there as a big target in the middle of the field. And then you typically have a wheel type route from another receiver or a running back or someone that takes the sideline and kind of takes the top off of things. And it typically will like run guys off each other than a rub, make sure that like it will distract zones and leave someone open on a sit down route or those kinds. Of, it has a bunch of options in it. Dana coaches up very well. Dana's teams have run it very well. You can go back and watch a lot of Clayton tune tape and a lot of his stuff where he's hitting, uh, 
I had Matthew Gold, I was going to say, or Tank Dell, after Tank Dell's running stuff across the field, if you just rewind the playback like three seconds, you see that he's running a mesh concept in the middle of the field and then butt naked open on the other side, right? Um, mesh concepts really work really well in this because they're all hap all that stuff is happening super, super short underneath um, everything. Like that, the some of my favorite concepts in the short game kind of stuff are slant, slant, arrow, where you have trips to the right, and you have slant, slant, and the arrow guy becomes kind of a natural rub route. Uh, you also have um, I don't know, post out, speed out, those kind of things that rub guys off one another as well. Um, and it's all quick, quick stuff that happens inside of 10 yards, making quick decisions. All right, you know, this guy's running speed out, and if, uh, and if he's running speed out and fade on the outside right there right, with a post coming across, right? You're simply reading which uh, guy the nickelback covers. He is wrong, right? As soon as he catches it, you throw into the guy that he is not covering because he is wrong on the snap. You're just getting the ball to your guy in the hand of space, right? That's all you're trying to do is make the first guy wrong at the first level of attack. Um, I like what this does for some of the quick fade game that Matthew Golden's really good at. Um, obviously, like the play that jumps to mind the most is like the game winner against Temple last year. But the quick fade game is where it's just like a quick stutter and then burst, and the quarterback is throwing it on a second step, right? Just one, two throw, where they made a pre snap read based on alignment, assignment, who's where on the field. That guy can't keep up with Matthew. Right. You saw it last year against Temple, but you also saw it this year against Rice in the end zone for a touchdown. Frankly, three of Matthew Golden's touchdowns this year. Um, the opening one against UTSA, I guess his first touchdown against UTSA. Um, he had a touchdown in the uh, same Houston game as well, where he's making a three step move and then off the ball to a fade or a seam. And the ball is thrown kind of before he's open, but it's thrown to a spot where Matthew's just going to go run under it or in this case of the UTSA game, go run and jump ball for it. Um, those things happen once you've run a lot of short game stuff because it pulls the defense down. It gets them down close line of scrimmage because the only way they can take away all of those things as they come down the line of scrimmage, right? That means I know where my guy's going. He knows where he's going. I can throw it before they have time to react and then get there because I got a great athlete there, right? Matthew Golden's a pro. It works very well. But I also think it works well for guys like Sam Brown, Boogie Johnson, et cetera, right? It's a good, good concept once you've got the defense collapsed. And then we get the defense collapses again, these short, short throws. So it opens up those kind of things too. The thing that helps with Donovan and a schematics thing is this uh, play action options or what I'm really calling RPO options because I think that um, I don't think it's called play action. I think he just pulls it to throw the ball, right? But all of those things um, help complement the short pass game because the short pass concepts, the rub routes, so those kind of, et cetera, all develop while that play action or RPO is happening. So it freezes the linebackers. It freezes the box players. It freezes those guys stuck in mud because they got to make sure they play the run, et cetera. And then he can pull it out and throw because he's got the option to throw. It also is the kind of route that's developing. Generally speaking, these short, uh, short throws are developing before linemen continue their blocks and are downfield, right? You can't run an RPO that turns into a dagger concept, 15 yards downfield, because by the time those things are breaking, you got linemen six, seven yards downfield because they didn't know if you were running or passing, Right running a slant, slant, arrow, quick quick hitters, et cetera, the linemen are typically maybe a yard and a half, two yards, because they're just they're still getting into the box and the system, and they don't know if running or passing, but doesn't matter at that point, right? Um, I also think, and this will be where I leave this, this is not really quite schematics. I think it's not X's and O's, but it is schematics. Um, it helps in this system to rotate wideouts. I think one frustration of mine, you've heard me on the show, that from Dana's staff this year, they've not rotated the wideouts. It's mostly been the big three guys, right? The starters being Sam Brown, Joseph Manjack, and obviously Matthew Golden. But this is the best wide receiver room Dana said he's ever had, right? You got Josh Cobbs, Boogie Johnson. You got the best freshman group you've ever had come into the University of Houston playing wideout. And I will say, we found out on Monday, uh, Monday morning, that it sounds like Jonah Wilson, Michael and Pilot are dealing with injuries. And frankly, any injury as a freshman for those guys may be worth just redshirt. They haven't said they're redshirting, but at this point, we'll see. They might finish out the season with the last two or three games and play the bowl game or something because you can play four games or less and be redshirted. But I'm worried. Um, I'm worried we're not going to see them this year. They're all safe. Um, with that said, though, you got a couple things happening. One, in the Sam Houston game, before we called off the dogs and put the subs in, you did see 
Boogie Johnson and Josh Cobbs play more. Josh Cobbs played 18 offensive snaps and no special teams. Uh, previous week, for instance, he played five offensive snaps and 11 snaps on special teams. So he's moving in their direction to be a more true offensive player. You also saw Boogie Johnson play 34 snaps and none of them aren't special teams. Um, I think, first of all, that's his high on the season. I think that's notable because he played 22 of those snaps out wide, where his previous games he'd been playing more a higher percent of his snaps inside in the slot so something clicked where they think he's better out there than inside or whatever and that may frankly play to his strengths he's so fast guys go watch go watch the stuff he did at Oklahoma. he's so fast he's so fast so fast um i also wonder at the slot spot and i'm not i'm not rooting against oila i hope that he does very very well but i did think it's a little ridiculous that one oila pass turn into like do we have a quarterback controversy online so much so that i even sarcastically tweet about it. and actually people respond to me but the thing I think that's worth taking away that isn't crazy quarterback controversy th- at this point, maybe there's one later, but not at this point, um, is the guy he threw that one pass to, the guy he threw that one completion that went like 16 yards in the air to that turned into a 58-yard touchdown was Stacey Sneed. And Stacey Sneed is typically a running back and a pass-catching running back that was lined up in the slot on that play. With Tony Mathis coming back, with the emergence of Parker Jenkins, because I'm president of the Parker Jenkins fan, fan club, I'm claiming it. With those things happening, do you move Stacy Sneed to more of a smaller slot player? And does he get to do those kinds of things down, you know, eight yards, 10 yards, catching a slant, et cetera, and just turning up field and bursting more often? Because if so, this team gets a lot better really, really fast. And I really, really like what he could turn into now i want to transition for a second and talk some about the basketball team but before i get to talking about that basketball team i do need to tell you about one of our newest partners and that is doordash because let me tell you folks we have a three-month-old uh, we're a one-car family with a three-month-old and it is sometimes difficult to get out and do grocery shopping especially when it's something like i got everything but i'm missing some syrup, or I've got everything, but I'm missing those little guacamole packs. I got everything, but I'm missing Julio's tortilla chips. Whatever the case may be, DoorDash can help me find those things. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you can always find the best in your neighborhood and boost your local economy with each and every order. You've trusted DoorDash to deliver your restaurant favorites, and now you get grocery delivery that actually delivers to from DoorDash. You'll actually get exactly what you ordered, or they'll make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them yourself. If you want more value, you can save on all your groceries and restaurant favorites with a $0 delivery fee on all eligible orders with a Dash Pass membership with, with e substitutions right on the app. It is best in class customer service. DoorDash groceries is exactly how you want it. Get 50% off your DoorDash order up to $20 value. When you use code locked on college at checkout. Limited time offer terms to apply. That's 50% off a $20 no minimum subtotal with zero delivery fees on your first order. When you download the DoorDash app in the app store and enter code locked on college. Don't forget that's code locked on college for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. That's one I really like reading because I really do actually use that quite often these days. I uh, have to recommend DoorDash whenever you get the chance. Now, I want to talk some of the hoop schedule because – so on Tuesday morning, the hoop schedule comes out. The Big 12 schedule comes out for Houston, and I have to point out that if you're listening to this too late in the day on Tuesday, it might already be out. Please listen to this and then go check it out after. Um, but I want to remind people of a couple things because the matrix was already out, meaning we already know – who the opponents are, and where they're playing. We just don't know when they're playing. We know the home-and-home matchups were Cincinnati, Iowa State, Kansas, Texas, and Central Florida. Um, The question I have as I look at the schedule and look forward to the schedule are those Kansas and Texas games, which are Saturday nights, which are big Monday nights, because ESPN and college basketball typically puts their biggest games of the week on those two nights, and I think it's safe to say that Kansas, Texas, and Houston – will all be in the top 10 or 25, not, if not 25, in the top 10 at various points of the season. It could very well be matched up like that when they finally play each other, right? So if that's the case, will it be a Saturday matchup where we have like a fun time and like we can all get to Lawrence, we can all get to Austin? Because I'd like to go see one in the fog myself. Or will those be 
Monday matchups because Big Monday is a fun thing. Once uh, Monday Night Football is out the door and there's nothing else on Monday night, Big Monday takes over television for college sports. But that does make that like if that's the home game. That's a lot of fun. If that's the game in Lawrence, Kansas. That can make for a challenging trip for to go travel for fans. So, what nights are those games happening? Um, and we'll obviously break down those matchups as we get closer to them, as we always do here at Lockdown Cougs. Um, I also think it's interesting that when are the Central Florida and Cincinnati games happening as home and homes? Making those home and homes feels like the Big Twelve is kind of forcing some American Athletic Conference alumni rivalry thing. Um, but if those games are like on the Thursdays doesn't do the same for the TV schedule, right? Um, the home games we know are Kansas State. The home only games should are Kansas State, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, and West Virginia. That's the way the matrix worked out. We only get to see those teams once, and we see them at home. That also means Jerome Tang is coming back to town after having coached 10 years of high school ball at Heritage Christian Academy, which is just over the road in Cleveland, right? Cleveland, Texas. I should probably specify, but Cleveland, Texas. Um, so while he's familiar with the Houston area and frankly has recruited the Houston area when he was at Baylor and now the head coach at Kansas State, when is his welcome home party? Um, because he's going to be in Houston to coach at some point. And is that a Saturday game itself? And the kind of instance where you know, like Kelvin Sampson, Jerome Tang, Houston fans can have a big fun night. Um, <laughs> frankly, does Heritage Christian Academy show up as a team to that game, whatever, right? Or is that a Thursday game, right? What happens there? Um, and then the road trips. So Houston's got... Four road only opponents Baylor, TCU, Oklahoma, BYU. Now, Oklahoma is about a six ish hour drive. Um, and that's thus three fourths of the teams that are road trips are less than six hour drive or six hours or less drives. And I, I mean, BYU and Provo is a pretty place. Spend some time there, but it, it it's a pretty place. It's got weird laws on things like enjoying beverages, but it's a pretty place, right? Um, and frankly, that may not be your own cup of tea anyway. Um, the three games that are road-only opponents that are less than a six-hour drive, if those were to all line up where Houston fans could realistically get there, I actually think you'd have a pretty good turnout, right? If the Baylor game is on a Saturday or a Sunday, if the TCU game is on... I know it's a five-hour drive. Let's say it's on a Friday. If the OU game is on a Monday, if those games are short, frankly, also worth pointing out, the OU game will be Kelvin Sampson returning to Oklahoma, Mark the Night Calendar, whatever day it is. Those games are games that Houston fans may actually go to and travel very well to. If those games are on Wednesday, are you driving six hours, six and a half hours on a Wednesday and driving back in the middle of the night? I mean, Maybe. Maybe, but not likely, right? And so those are the kind of things I'm paying attention to is what games on the road can Houstonians actually get to? What games on the road can actually be fun to go to? Uh, the BYU game, I will encourage, go I mean, go visit Provo at some point while we're both at the same conference. Um, I just don't know if I'm looking at the schedule is the game I have to go to, especially BYU basketball currently. If they get Jimmy Fredette, somebody like that back, we'll talk again. I still have to say that the schedule is coming out and it's very fun. I also have to admit that bluntly, at this point, it's Tuesday. You might have already seen the schedule. If so, tell us down below what you think of it and what you think of the placement of games as far as days of the week. And also, if there's any rhyme or reason the order you think makes it more difficult, less difficult than it could have been. If there's a stretch of road games, like, oh my God, I can't believe they'd go to Lawrence and then to Baylor and then to BYU or whatever. Tell me in the comments down below what you think of the hoop schedule once it's out very, very soon, if it's not already. Thank you all so much for tuning into the show today. Locked on Cougs is a proud of Locked on Podcast Network. That means your team every day. Go Cougs.